Okay, so the students, maybe we will start. Let me introduce our guest today. Uh, he is a founder and leadership team member of uh, Kosovo International at USA, honorary professor of uh, the Ukrainian American Concordia University, Professor Marshall Christensen. Today we will speak about a very interesting topic, and I hope it also, and I'm sure that it will be very interesting for you. Also, if you have any questions, also don't hesitate to ask us. Also, you have chat, so you also can use it for some questions. Sorry, how long will this uh, um, lesson? As usually, one hour. Oh, okay, thank you. So now I switch on our presentation. Okay. Uh... Thank you for inviting me to Ukraine American Concordia University. It's a great honor for me. Uh, and I have had a long association with the university and I'm especially grateful to Yulia Romanovska and her husband who have treated me so um, graciously as a guest um, in the past and now today in this uh, webinar. So I'm going to follow an outline you'll see on your screens about this topic of introduction of servant leadership principles. This is actually a new way to look at leadership. Um, and I hope during this hour presentation or discussion, uh, you will come away with some new ideas about leadership. Maybe these are ideas you've thought about a long time, but uh, for many, they may be new and you may want to ask questions as uh, Natalia has suggested, but I'm gonna ask some questions too. Uh, my first question and the next slide is what, what is valuable? Uh, for a leader, this is a fascinating and important question. When you think about leadership, when you think about yourself as a future leader, what are the most valuable things in the world? Um, think, think about that. Uh, Can I? Do... Yes. Uh, I think it's information. Okay. I would like to say that it's uh, people and life because all the money in the world can't necessarily like make people do something and it can't make people, it, like life is something way more sacred than money. Yeah, Thank I you. totally agree with Oliver, it is human material. I would so, say time. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I would say it's time time Valuable. yes I, I uh -huh. would say it's the understanding of people and how relations between people work yeah you you see that in the outline i have on this page uh but you know many people when asked about uh what is most important they would say success or um goals met some would say wealth, uh, some would say power uh, as a leader. And so what we're asking you to do is think about what behaviors correspond with making people and relationships the most important. Is that really the most important thing? And what what that question raises is your core values, we call them. In each of us, we have personal values and core values. Your core values perhaps came from family, from your culture, from your language. Um, so, so I'm asking you to think carefully about what are the deep down core values that we apply to good behavior. And what is good behavior? What is bad behavior? Um, if you go to the next slide, 
we can see some of the implications. Um, values actually come from our heart, uh, and not just our mind. You've heard the, uh, the quotation on this page where it says, uh, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Are you familiar with that phrase? Yeah, I've, I've heard it a couple of times ago okay. before. I actually haven't heard that before. It's quite interesting. Thank you. Where are you from? Well, it's actually from Jesus. Um, he told people, his disciples, that uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And uh, we think that's true. Because it, do you find it true for yourself that you act on the basis of what you think is most important? And so we're, we're really raising a, a important question here. If we put people and relationships before anything else as leaders, um, what difference does that make in our behavior? So we, the, if you think about the condition of the world, would you agree that the world has a leadership problem? Yeah, definitely. Like, I would like to, on all levels. Sorry. Go ahead. I'd like to say also that I think it, while it's important to put people first, um, we have to think of like people, like what's best for people, not just necessarily what they want. Because like, for example, there's a lot of people who might put, put like other people's and their own short-term goals uh, like much higher than like what's actually best for the world and society. And uh, Josiah, I would agree with that, um, that we, as people, we have a, a long list of wants, right? But you use the word needs. And that's an important distinction between what people want and what they need. Many times people are crying to satisfy their needs, but then that for a leader, that raises the question, what is the difference between what we want and what, we, what people need? We're gonna talk about that more in a minute. Now in this next slide, um, I want to have you think about a, a important quote, a statement. And this is a, a well-known author uh, in the United States, um, Warren Bennis. And he says, the fact is America and its business community have been managed to the edge of ruin and now we're in a desperate need for leaders. Unfortunately, it is increasingly difficult to find men and women of vision who are willing to stand on principle and make their voices heard. One has to wonder where have all the leaders gone? His, this quotation, uh, it actually points to an important idea you know, about leadership. Notice that he distinguishes between management and leadership. Have you ever thought about the difference between leadership and management? Yep, of course. It's like almost completely different things. Because management is about how to manage, actually. But uh, leadership is how to manage properly, effectively. And uh, it is not according only some materials or resources. 
it's also about True. people for example i'd say differently i'd not say that uh, leadership is anything about like management uh i'm sorry leadership is part of management but management is not a part of leadership i'd say like i'd say it like this because leadership is a completely different thing it has nothing to do with management it's uh yeah i think that i said what i meant thank you maxim uh because we need good management don't we but there is a difference between leadership and management. So I, I appreciate the fact that you see that difference. That's an important distinction. Can I add one thing to that? Please. I'd like to say also that I feel like leadership is about actually accomplishing what's best for everyone involved. Uh, to get them to where they need to be. And management is simply about uh, achieving certain goals without necessarily having everyone's best interests involved. What do you think about uh, the statement Bennis makes when he said that many people have been managed to their ruin? I think that people have ultimately, especially in America, been managed. Everyone goes after short-term goals and uh, profits and things like that, while more or less sacrificing what's needed as a whole for... I think, can I add something? I think that maybe he means that uh, people don't need to be managed at the current situation. They need to be lead it somewhere. So, and there, those are again, different things and people are being uh, actively managed in most of the uh, countries and in most of the places of work and most of jobs, but they need to be actually needed to create something truly great. I think that's what he means. Thank you, good. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And what I want you to do here is Think about the difference between organizational structures. Um, what, what, how would you describe a common organization structure in a business, for example? Hierarchical structure. Hierarchical? Uh huh. Focused on achieving specific results. Yes. Always. Please. So oh, do, do, do I need to list the results that it uh, wants to achieve? Effectiveness, it wants to achieve uh, if, uh, unity of command. Like, yeah. 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 yeah, effectiveness, unity of command, maximum profitability. Uh, it wants people to always uh, be uh, under control. It wants all the parts of the system to always be controlled. And the control is uh -huh. the word I want to use here, not uh, uh -huh. not leader, lead it again, but controlled more, more like managed. This is, it's focused on management highly. So in, in that kind of a structure, uh, what, is, what are the values, what values jump out at you? Um, the structure itself, when, which is hierarchical. It values control. Uh, it values that everything needs to, even in democratical structures, it values uh, control over anything else because even if you're giving your employees freedom, you're already sure that uh, you have control over the final result anyway. So uh, I, I, what I mean by that, maybe that's a little bit unclear, is that uh, anyone, even people who value democratical leadership over uh, authoritarian, they still want some level of control. And this is what modern organizational <laughs> structure encompasses, it encompasses control. And so that's like governmental structure because people just want control and power mostly. So do you, you see the, con the conflict inherent uh, already in the structure? Um, if most businesses are organized on the basis of hierarchy, um, how does that make people feel? What do, what do people want? Well, most people want, to, want uh, freedom of choice. And they don't want to be told what to do, but they are told what to do. So they feel not really good about it. Also, people want to be valued and to feel important. Exactly. Uh, so when we talk about servant leadership, what we're talking about are the values 
that help people feel important, that they are part of the organization, not just being told, not just being uh, controlled. Would you agree? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah, it, there's an interesting um, illustration in American Sign Language. Do you do you know the term sign language yeah. for people? Who, yeah, of who are, course, of course. Okay, let me show you what it is. The sign is like that. What do you think that says? What? Uh, why would this? talk to uh, describe management uh maybe this sign describes like human like me and this like to be managed to be told to do something, or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> well yeah this when you see two bars on a person's shoulder what what are those two bars representing I don't know, like human, myself. Yeah. Well, or when you see somebody on the street and that person ha has a uniform on. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh-huh. What, what does that tell oh, the, you? Uh, in the uh, signs of uh, the military, military designation signs, yeah. Exactly, yeah. it, like military or uh, a policeman or someone, yeah. some official, right? Yeah. Someone, someone who has, has rights to control you. Exactly. What if the next part of this, what does the next part of the sign say? Because it's where you're, you take a hand and you, you go like this by your side. So you go from here to a hand. Uh, like everyone's in control, no? Well, Maybe it's... That's... It's taking a person's hand, say, say there's someone walking next to you and you take that person's hand, what does that symbolize? Friendship, agreement. Fr yeah, yeah, it's, it's like being a friend. Um, so if you put those together, the sign for power and control is this, whereas the hand is like, I'm coming as a leader to help you. And we, we think that's a powerful image because this is the management sign because it's power and control. Whereas the, the hand uh, reaching out to grab the person next to you is say, I'm here to help you. So that's, that uh, sign language symbol is really Im important. Uh, sends a set, uh, important message. Go to the next uh, slide, please. And how do our values affect our influence and ability as leaders to motivate others? Think about this, uh, these categories for a minute. How did your parents, for example, how did they influence you? Um, how did they motivate you? Here you are students. Uh, how do teachers influence you? And maybe you've uh, been in work places and I'm interested in the question, how, how do managers in business uh, either influence or motivate you? Do you have an example or examples you can share with us? I'd say that parents use blunt authority. They just say, uh, usually say that, uh, well, uh, you're our a child, so we have control over you and we can tell you what to do. That's one way to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's only one example. Teachers use your, their control over your grades and your uh, outcome of your education process, mostly. And managers <laughs> use uh, control over your job and your uh, financial flow so yeah that's basically the primary i think uh strategies that they use i would say for myself personally um none of like 
I've never been motivated by anyone trying to necessarily like control me or using their authority as something like to lord over me. In fact, every time, whether it be a teacher, a parent, or someone in the workplace tried to do that, it's actually caused me to have kind of the opposite reaction they were hoping for. But the people who have really motivated me are the people who have uh, showed that they believe in me and that they think that I'm important and they believe that I can do well. And they kind of like get behind me and help me to become a better person. And those are really the things that have like motivated me uh, personally, at least. Wow, thank you, Josiah. I'd say that I mostly meant not uh, the ideal strategies to use, but what is more, most often used because, well, we know that although it's maybe better for uh, teachers to take a more democratic approach, uh, especially in schools, they more often just use their control over your grades and quality of life uh, as, a, as usual, not as it should be. Yeah, you use the example of school, so, uh, and, and grades, um, and how does that make you feel? Do you sometimes feel like uh, either the teacher or the education system itself is in control and telling you what you must do in order to succeed? Of course, yeah, many times, especially in Ukraine, because uh, we have a lot of stuff that I, uh, a lot of students feel they don't need to learn, especially in, in high school. Uh, or in middle school and uh, they are still told to do that and they have no choice but to learn it or or, or yeah they have no second option basically so yeah i have that feeling many times no, no more have because you? i'm at the university but yeah sure yeah. Yeah, not every teacher is a good teacher sometimes they just uh, use their power to uh... well the problem is in the education system like no one is gonna work for like 300 bucks a month, that's what teachers are paid here. Not like, okay, 500, 400 to 500. No one's gonna provide any quality service for that amount of money. I think that we're talking about management, not economics. I mean, there are people who provide great service and uh, uh, help people for free, volunteers. Uh, I'm not saying that teachers, teachers should be volunteers. I'm just saying that uh, we have a fundamental problem with our education system and it's not necessary. Uh, yeah, there are also by, people in Africa like, that kill each other yeah. for like two dollars. Yeah, and there are people in Ukraine who kill each other for a little bit more. Yeah, uh, we. this is not the discussion, I think. So think of a teacher who has encouraged you uh, through her or his influence. Can you give me an example of, of a teacher who motivated you to achieve your best? And how did that teacher do that um, without trying to control you? What, what was it about that teacher that motivated you? Usually the teachers that motivated me the most without controlling me were the ones who uh, saw my potential. They would really encourage me and point out the things that I was doing right. And if I did make a mistake, uh, they would really make it clear that they believed that I could do better. And they would give me any resources that they felt they could to help me do better. Uh, sometimes they would challenge me a bit, but it was always with like an understanding that they wanted to see me do better, not just that they wanted to punish me or something like that. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. Uh, I'd say that teachers that listened because the job of a teacher is to speak and it's uh, not a very common uh, occurrence for them to listen, but when they listen and when they provide feedback that may be extremely helpful and uh, very motivational. Isn't that interesting that a, a teacher who listens to the student and says, hey, I see qualities in you that are excellent. And if you develop these qualities, you're going to achieve great things. Uh, I hear you saying those are the people who motivate you. Yeah, you just said basically the words of uh, one of my greatest teachers uh, verbatim. So yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly what happens. 
So what we're saying then is servant leadership, if you accept that term, is often the kind of leader who motivates you through their influence and not through their control. Yeah, okay, let's say the school system has to evaluate, you have to take tests, but who, what kind of a teacher helps you achieve your best? The one who says, you must do it my way, you must get the right answer or you're a failure. None of us like to hear that the teacher thinks of us as a failure. We, we listen to, we try to uh, fulfill the expectation of teachers who uh, pay attention to us who want us to achieve our best. So, and what I'm say, suggesting here is that uh, servant leaders are those kinds of people who do exactly that. They, they pay attention. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. Uh, what we've said so far then is there are two approaches to influence. One is the power approach, and that's the ability to force someone to do uh, your will because of your position, because you have that position at the top of an organization. Uh, or the second approach is a relational and service-oriented approach to leadership. And in that case, you influence others through a relationship that shows you that you see others as equally valuable and that you care about them. Do you agree with uh, those two approaches to leadership and influence? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, 100%. That's see any other options maybe a mix of both can be an option sometimes but usually that's one of two yeah uh -huh. i would say yeah that uh a good leader should obviously sometimes needs to kind of turn on the power switch like for example in emergency <laughs> situations and things like that because uh if there's, let's say, like a hurricane and everyone needs to evacuate or something, you don't really have time to make like uh, democratic decisions about that. But in largely being relationship and service oriented is, I think, the most effective way to lead people. Yeah, because if, if you say, okay, time is more important than people, we have to get this job done. We, we have to reach our goal, then you, you're substituting time for relationship. And there's a the cost to that, do you see? Well, and also I would say that there's certain things that, uh, as we kind of mentioned before, sometimes people's wants and their needs don't always line up. They think they want something, but that's not actually what they need. And a good leader sometimes has to do not what his or her people want, but what they largely need. And sometimes this means going against what they want. Uh, for in the example of like the uh, hurricane or something like that. And that's a time where you do need to kind of use your power a little bit, but if you've built up a strong rapport with your people by using relationship and service uh, based leadership in most of the time, then they're going to most likely listen and be willing to follow you when you do decide that, okay, we need to make a decision because this is actually what's best for everyone. I, I like your use of the word we. <laughs> See, the, the leader who is power oriented more often uses the word I. And you've just used the we. <laughs> So a plural pronoun is, is terribly important. Um, so if a leader can say, we as a team have agreed 
that these are our goals and this is our timeline, the chances are the group, the team will work together towards that goal. So be, be very careful uh, when using power instead of relationship. That's what we're suggesting here. And one of the ways to achieve that, uh, it shows on the next slide, um, what we call um, respect. And I want you to pay attention to the definition of leadership that James Hunter uses. Leadership is the skill of influencing people to work enthusiastically toward goals as identified as being for the common good. Um, how do you how do you reach that point? Is do you agree with uh, James Hunter? He wrote a, a a very important book called The Servant. It's actually a story, um, and if, I think you can download it uh, so if if uh, you have access to the internet. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's. Uh... That's exactly that. And you used a uh, quote, uh, I think, from uh, the Bible uh, earlier. And uh, Jesus is one of the greatest examples of leaders, actually, because uh, we can say that uh, uh, he didn't tell people what to do. He told people that they can do something to feel to, to, for their life to become, become better. He didn't say, like, you must, you must do this or else I will kill you. He just told us, you must do this to be saved. So that's uh, the important difference I think we need to make because uh, power leadership is uh, basically you must do this or else and uh, real like relationship leadership is servant leadership is you must do it, do it because. Isn't that interesting, Maxim? Because uh, his, his own disciples asked Jesus, well, what's the most important commandment? Do you remember? Uh, yeah. yeah. And he, love your, uh, love your, love your closest one as uh, yourself. And you're, you're, love, yeah, love, yeah. love God and love your closest one as yourself. Ex so exactly. Yeah. Those, when you listen to all of the rules, and you remember the the Hebrew people had uh, thousands of years of rules, regulations, and he and his disciples were in a discussion with him one time, and one of them asked, "Well." You know, We've been living by these rules all of our lives. We've been taught these things since we were children. What's really the most important thing? And you just summarized it nicely. Thank you, Maxim. Because he said, love God and love your neighbor, he said, as yourself. Now, when you think about it, uh, that's the key. You can say, okay, I love God, and God gave me life, God gave me my health, God gave me my family, my culture. But then Jesus says, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's hard, right? But it's a summary of everything else. So how are you going to act if you are loving your neighbor as yourself? Um and I think James Hunter in his uh, quotation here captures the essence of it. Um, how do we get as leaders, how do we get people to work enthusiastically? Yes, we have goals, but they want to know that you as a leader care about them, right? Yeah. And I, I think uh, one of the reasons why we have a leadership crisis in the world today is because many people don't feel that their boss cares about them. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. And the, the boss is not like has any incentive to care because they're not taught that it matters. They just think that their power is all they need to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's definitely a huge reason why there is like a leadership crisis today. And there are definitely like some people who are kind of onto it 
Um, there's one person I actually I follow on like Instagram and Twitter. His name's Dan Price, and he's out of Seattle. And he actually realized that most of the people who were working for his company, even though he had like an IT company, um, they weren't actually making enough money to afford to continue living in Seattle. And he realized that like they were paying those employees competitive wages, but even the competitive wage wasn't enough to actually be able to afford basic necessities like rent and healthcare or anything like that. So um, he ended up like boosting the pay of all his employees to like $70,000 a year. And it's been like a really great move for his company and they've like actually become very, very successful. And I think that's like a lot of the, the fact that the average uh, like wage wasn't able to sustain even like a place to stay for his employees, even though it was competitive, tells a lot about like the situation, at least in America. And I think it's even worse over here where because employers, if they can pay you less, they will, instead of really actually caring about the people who are doing work for them and giving them incentives by paying them maybe a little bit more so they know that they're taken care of at home. Uh, and this would really show that they care about those people and they can lead them. Josiah, that's another great example. Thank you. Uh, can I add something about uh, this issue? Please. Yeah, I think if you want uh, that uh, people will work enthusiastically in your company, I think uh, every employee uh, want to feel that uh, he or she is valuable and uh, he or she can uh, make some decisions. I think it's very important to be enthusiastically in the company. I I, I like that, uh, Squally. Everyone wants to feel they're important. I I brought to our our mini uh, webinar today uh, another book that's one of my favorites. It's called Joy at Work. And uh, the author is Dennis Bakke. And I know a little bit about this. It's an energy company that he founded, but he, he actually practiced what you just said. Um, he listened to people and he, get, he got them involved in, in the decisions and they felt like they were part of the team um, and as a result, they worked enthusiastically. And, and a, a little company, an energy company in the United States uh, grew around the world. It, I think they have something like 40 uh, different places around the world where they're working in the energy field. But the point is, uh, he actually practiced the principle of loving people. Uh, showing them his his love as a as an owner of a company, um, and he took some big risks, just like um, Josiah, you you mentioned the company in Seattle um, that gave people more than they expected in order to meet their needs. Uh, uh, Vladislav, I would you uh, jump forward to the the um, slide that says uh, it talks about abraham maslow hey, excuse me but isn't it only applicable to like specialists because like people who do manual jobs like that can potentially be automatized in the future you don't care about them everyone can do those jobs like for yeah, but example people who do manual jobs can, sorry people who do manual jobs can be more effective too if you care about them that's uh that's the thing, because if you do a manual job, you, you actually can be more effective if you care about the job. But if a person quits doing a manual job, there are like <laughs> 13 volunteers to do the same job because like the working market in Ukraine, at least, is so, let's just say. What if you, you that's, the word that, that's the one, number 12, number 12. Um, what, what if you uh, went to someone who was street, uh, sweeping the streets and said, 
hey, I appreciate your work. Thank you for helping clean our streets. How do you think that would make that uh, street sweeper feel? It would make him feel good, but the reality will still be that he is sweeping streets for minimal amounts of money, for pitiful amounts of money, I'd, I'd say. It's not it possible will, it will to live to on say that. I'd money. say that it will not change the reality, but the reality is actually not that bad. It's, it depends on how you look at it. And if you look at it, wow, it's extremely bad. Like I clean streets, that's like the worst thing that I can do probably. Uh, but if you look at it like I'm helping people and I'm helping, I'm, I'm like a part of infrastructure that supports the whole city. If you think about it that way, and if you're encouraged by other people to think that way, then you will be more effective and you will be more satisfied even with your life. And as a person, you will be happier. Well, let's let's Basically not think idealistically and just think realistically. If you sweep streets, you make the city infrastructure better, yada, yada. But you still take home like 12k grievous a month is like 400 bucks you can't afford a house a normal housing you have to live in a i don't know in a room with several flatmates you can't afford anything you can't if you have a family then you're <laughs> there is no ability for you whatsoever to provide for that family if you get what i'm saying I, I agree with you. Uh, let me have you focus your attention on this chart for a moment, because what we're really talking about is what uh, the psychologist Abraham Maslow raised many years ago when he asked, what are the people's real needs? Um, and you see at this in this pyramid, everybody needs uh, food, water, shelter. And that's what we were just talking about. Can you can a street sweeper uh, make enough money to afford an apartment and water and food? Uh, that's basic. Well, as, as secondly, in this pyramid, he says everybody needs safety and security. We we need to feel like wherever we live, we have that. Uh, we, we're not going to be threatened. And then a higher, we, we have the need to feel like we belong to an organization or to a family, um, to our neighborhood. But beyond that, we need, he said, self-esteem. And so leader is thinking of all of these, including helping every person feel self-esteem, even self-actualization. Do you, do you understand that concept of self-actualization? Mm, yeah, I think it's about like when you feel that you're, you're doing something that is good for everyone. I mean, like when you feel that you deserve something in the world, in a globalistic thinking, I mean. Exactly. So if you as a citizen appreciate the person who's uh, sweeping the streets in Kiev, uh, maybe for that day, that person feels appreciated. Someone cares, even though I don't make enough money, but somebody still cares that I am providing a service that's important to our society. Uh, that's what I wanted actually to say, because as a passerby, as, a, as someone who has uh, little to no uh, ways to make his food, water, shelter characteristics better, and so, as someone who has no way to provide him safety and security, and someone who is really estranged from that person, has no ability to, to give them belonging and love, we can give them the only thing that we can which is uh, self-esteem and self-actualization so that that's why it's worth it because uh there are things that we can give to people even if we cannot help them financially or with uh, belonging and love but if we have uh, self-actualization let's just say he will be let's what do I want to say? he'll be more satisfied with his life than he would have been without it which is already better yeah, but, know, he, but not everything he, but is about he would money. be content yeah. at his, let's uh, just say, bad position in life, and he will continue being in that bad position in life instead of self-improving, 
searching for oh. new opportunities. Well, did you so see a lot of people who are depressed self-improving? Because I didn't, and I'm just asking. Maybe you saw that. I think that nope. actually, yeah, because actually, when you are when you feel self-esteem and self-actualization, if you if you if your self-esteem is erased, then you feel that oh, maybe I'm worth more than a street sweeper. Maybe I need to go for more, and then you start start self-improving. But if you're if you're constantly depressed, if you're not uh, gratified for your work in any way, uh, save for like some money, then what what do you have? You like live the worst life in your opinion. Then why self improve? That's that's why it's worth it to raise people's self esteem. Because you live the bad life, you want to live a better life. That's why you self improve. Yeah. Hey, can I add something to this? Because I think it's really important to note that like street sweepers aren't necessarily like a bad position to have in life. In fact, I think really the problem is that the government here isn't paying them enough to be able to support themselves and to just like have pride in what they do. Because, like, yo, in New York, like, being uh, a city worker is actually, like, one of the better things you can do for yourself. Like, they get, like, paid a decent amount. They get all sorts of, like, health benefits and stuff. And it's like, yo, they really are keeping the city clean. If you didn't have them, like, the city would be trash. And so really respecting those people is essential. And that doesn't just mean, like, smiling at them or saying whatever, but, like, the government respecting them and paying them a good amount realizing that they're essential workers like i i think that their whole view in society should be respected more like yeah, you're they're talking about america no i'm sorry i just wanted to know that uh, it's like a staple in ukraine like a street sweeper a uh, worst uh, a worst job it's just like a staple that teachers use in schools so that's why we're talking about it but obviously yeah, yeah but i'm saying like, that mindset needs best. to change because those people yeah you might have it as a staple that it's like the worst job in like america people talk about like oh, yeah, you're just going to turn into, like, a ditch digger or a garbage man. But, like, yo, those are really important jobs that we need in our society. And without those people, our society would not be able to grow. So, like, I think that everyone just needs to, like, stop degrading those people because that's actually something that we need. And no one would be able to lead if there weren't people to lead. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think Oliver just gave a perfect example of why the point that we need to give self-esteem and self-actualization is valid because in Ukraine... Uh, they don't have like, that much self-esteem. But as you said, in the United States, they have actually more of esteem and self-actualization. They have more uh, food, water, shelter. People less respect them more. People are willing to pay them more. This uh, actually can work both ways. Well, it's yeah, because yeah. trade in the U.S. is actually, let's just say, a nice field to get into because you don't get into as much debt as you would by, by attending college. And you get way nicer salaries out of a trade school than out of a college. But in our country, the situation is just flipped on its head. Well, <clears throat> let, me, let me try to summarize. Uh, what you, let, let's assume that everybody has influence, okay? And this, your discussion in, indicates that you have some influence, even if it's going as a passerby on the street, to tell somebody you appreciate the fact that they're keeping the streets clean for you. That's influence. As a servant leader, you have influence. And what we would like for you to think about is as future leaders, you can help other people understand that they have influence. Everybody has some influence and therefore everybody has the potential to be a leader. Would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. People often overlook that because they think, oh, well, the president of my country is the guy who has influence. Why, why would someone speak about me as about someone who has influence? But I'd say that it's like, uh, it's like having, having uh, like everybody has some influence over uh, certain people. And if you mm -hmm. see someone who has more influence than you, you don't need to just think that, oh, well, that means that I don't need actually to use my influence. They will use it for me. You, everyone needs to use their influence for this world to be better and to the best of their ability. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Then the question is, how do you develop your influence? Practice it. Uh, Practically, as, yeah. As strange as it may sound, yeah, practice influence. I'd say yeah. influence is a lot about, it definitely takes practice, but uh, to develop it, you really just have to learn to listen to people and to 
get outside of your own mind and your own perspective to kind of see things from other people's perspective because that's the only way that you're really going to see because there's a like uh, in psychology we're talking about how there's the golden rule which is like do unto others as you would have others do unto you but then like with psychology there's i think it's called like the diamond rule or something which is like do unto others as they would want done unto them you know because everyone has different wants and needs and you know for me if i'm someone who's like a very like motivated person already like how i might want someone to treat me would be different than like if someone's really like down in the dirt like they're kind of depressed like you might have to treat them a little bit differently like maybe they need motivation whereas like for me i don't need motivation and so you have to kind of be able to notice that oh hey they're down in the dumps they're not where i'm at where i already have plenty of motivation so what they need is for me to come by and just tell them they're doing a good job tell them that they look great today that you know they can that what they do matters to me and maybe that will help give them that little bit of motivation whereas like if i see someone who's like a successful like business person who's super motivated and doing all those things like okay i might approach them differently to kind of have influence over them like and not over them but like to influence them and to kind of show them that i care about them because they might not need the same sort of motivation and stuff like that so listening to other people so you know what they need is really important um let me we're getting close to the end of our hour here so let me uh, suggest as a uh, closing uh Vladislav, would you go to the second to the last um, point where it says it's talking about leadership, kinds of leadership? Yeah, the one you just had it. Way at the end. Anyway, um, that that's one right there. Um, when you think about leadership, and listening, I'd like for you to think about the different kinds of listening. How, and my, my point is, how do you listen to another person? Um, one kind of listening that we find quite common is pretend listening. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where someone is saying something from their heart? This is really important to them. And uh, you're, you're sort of listening, but you're not really listening. You pretend to listen. Uh, have you ever been in that situation where you pretend to listen instead of really hearing what they say? Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's part of our human nature, isn't it? Okay. The uh, second kind of listening is competitive listening, whereas... Oh, you're telling this really nice story, but I've got, I can't wait for you to finish your story because I've got a better story. We call that competitive listening. Um, That's what I do. Yeah, I, yeah, I completely understand this. Well, thank you for confessing because <laughs> I do that sometimes too. And then there's a, a third kind, which is the problem kind of self. Uh, problem solving kind of listening where you're listening to somebody who has a big problem in life uh, relationships are crazy and I'm just uh, suffering and my mood is bad uh, but let me tell you how to solve your problem what they don't oftentimes what they don't want is you to solve their problem they just want to know that you're listening and you care and that gets to the, the uh, effective kind of listening, empathetic listening, where, wow, your situation is, is important to me. I care about you. Uh, servant leadership means that you can, you give yourself to the other person. You give your time, you give your listening, uh, uh, effective listening. Um, and sometimes all people want is 
uh, someone who cares enough to listen carefully. You agree? Yeah, definitely. But uh, to my mind, uh, can, can I add something to this? Please, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's like a bunch of other types of listening. For example, you know, when you're trying to uh, get some information from the speech or something like that. So I think that list is not a complete. Type of listening when you want to support, it's mainly women type of uh, the like solving problems. They need just to tell the problem and see that you support them. That's all we need. We don't need uh, some advices or something. We well, just... In this case, it's a way of problem solving then. Yes. If just listening to you is uh, how to solve your problems, then it's still problem solving. Mm, I think, no, in my opinion. more about empathy, I would say. Well, if, if yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that if for some person, uh, all it takes to solve some problem is to say it out loud and you are the one who is going to listen, then technically you, you help them to solve their problem. problem. That's just like what, what I think about it. But again, I think uh, for Sophia's uh, um, type of listening, we need to like create one more bullet point here because it's it is not about problem solving and it is not about empathy. So, yeah, that's it. Okay, but uh, all of let me try to summarize because our time is now up. But um, in all of these things. You see that the leader is giving of self for the uh, people and relationships in a team. Uh, we could talk about many other uh, qualities, many other values. I, I'm thinking, for example, of uh, respect and vision. You share your vision. Um, you give your time. One of the really hard ones that we haven't talked about, but I want you to think about, is giving forgiveness. Um, every, you know, people make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And sometimes what people want from a leader is uh, forgiveness. I've had people come to me and I've had to go to other people and say, please forgive me. I made a terrible mistake. I treated you badly. And I shouldn't have done that. But think about the importance of that because uh, practicing forgiveness means you're giving for the relationship. People, I'm going back to where we started. People and relationships are the, the most important value if you accept the premise of servant leadership. I'm going to close now. And I'm going to, I want you to know how much I appreciate uh, your involvement. I know that many people who are participating in this uh, webinar were not able to talk. Thank you for listening to our conversation. Uh, thank you for participating in the webinar. And uh, we invite you to go on our CoServe International website and uh, check resources we have. And I, wish each of you, uh, there have been about 60 people on this uh, webinar, and I want to uh, tell you that our world needs servant leadership. And I, I trust that you will practice what you know um, that demonstrates you care about people and you want to preserve relationships. Look for it. Uh, and practice servant leadership in your family, in your university, um, in your, your workplace. And um, we'll be cheering for you because the world needs people like you who will listen and serve others for the common good. Well done. Thank you all. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, dear Thank Marco. you so much, too. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your great presentation. It was a big pleasure to hear new information, and I saw that our students also were interested on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's nice. good. Yeah, thanks for the lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.